Welcome everyone to the current edition of the Wharton AI Sirius XM podcast series here on artificial intelligence. I'm Eric Bradlow, Vice Dean of Analytics here at the Wharton School, also the KP Chow Professor of Marketing, Statistics, and Data Science. Today's episode, as all of our episodes are, is sponsored by Analytics at Wharton and AI at Wharton. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I think it's hard to walk down the street or talk to anyone in business and not have them speak about, which is AI and human resources. So I'm here today by two of my colleagues. The first is my colleague from the management department, Matthew Bidwell. Matthew is the Xingmei Zhang and Yangyi Dai professor, a professor in the management department. He's also the faculty director of a center that's a big part of analytics at Wharton, Wharton People Analytics Initiative. And he's also the academic director of Wharton's Center for Human Resources program. Matthew, welcome here to our show. Thank you very much for bringing me on, Eric. Oh, it's great to have you here. I'm also joined by my colleague, Sonny Tambe. Sonny is an associate professor of operations, information, decisions at the Wharton School, and also teaches many of our courses on AI. So Sonny, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you both on such an important topic. So let me start with the beginning. Matthew, maybe I'll start with you. Um, how do, since you're one of the or you are the faculty director now of Wharton People Analytics, um, how do you think AI is going to affect the way that we manage people? What are both the concerns that you have, and in, equally importantly, what are the big opportunities? Uh, big question. I mean, obviously, we need to think a little bit about how we define AI. There's kind of you know these days when we think about AI, we kind of leap straight to Chat GPT and large language models and so on. Or what people, a lot of people would call the generative AI part, where the computer, the large language model, is generating a response. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look back historically over the last five years, um, people have used AI almost to describe anything that involves numbers. So it, it's a broad range. Um, yeah, I think with any of these technologies as ever, there's a lot of opportunities to kind of improve how we manage people. Uh, when we look at how people are managed so much of what goes on is kind of gut decision making this kind of intuition and we have pretty much a century of research suggesting that our guts are terrible decision makers that actually there's a reason why we should be thinking with our brains rather than our stomachs um and so more broadly when we are more systematic when we are more thoughtful when we rely on data in making decisions who do we hire who do we promote how do we manage people all those sorts of things we usually make much better decisions. And so I think to the extent to which AI helps us be more systematic in doing that, um, it's going to be really helpful. It's already being helpful. There are obviously big concerns. Um, I think kind of three spring to mind. Um, so one big concern everybody has is bias and discrimination. Um, again, we know there's a lot of bias in the labor market. We know our guts are discriminating all of the time. Um, yeah, the good news is probably most of the time AI is going to be less discriminatory, but we think it's going to be discriminatory. Um, you know, particularly when we look at some of these more sophisticated large language models, right? They have been trained on the corpus of data that is out on the internet, even when people aren't being deliberately sexist and racist. Um, that embodies a whole set of cultural assumptions. So take sexism for example there's been some very nice studies that kind of look at word embedding models and other things that are trained on kind of the corpus of text that you see on the internet and they show not surprisingly that we think words to do with careers are more closely related to men's names and words to do with kind of home life and family more closely related to women's names and so once you start using those models to make decisions about employment i think the risks of bias and discrimination are very serious um and I think one of the things we worry about, particularly more generally with kind of using algorithms rather than judgment in managing people, is you know, if you have a manager that discriminates, that's a problem for the people working for that manager. If you have an algorithm that discriminates, the fact that I can apply a hiring algorithm at scale across an entire company, across an entire industry, the sheer volume of people that are potentially affected is huge. Um, so That's I think, one of the advantages of scale and the disadvantages of scale. Yeah. And so I think that is, I think that is a very live concern. Um, if I can go on a little bit, just talk about my other two concerns. Um, I know we have many other questions, but I think another couple of things that we're thinking about, um, 
algorithmic algorithms like any technology have often been applied in a fairly punitive way in HR. Um, so I think the the classic example of this is scheduling software. Um, and so with scheduling software, it's very tempting if you're an engineer sitting in kind of your office trying to do the right thing. You're like, how do I increase productivity? And the way I increase productivity is by carefully matching people's schedules to shifts in demand during the day. And so I'm running Starbucks. I want to give somebody a shift that starts at seven in the morning and then runs till 10. Well, by then we're through with the kind of office rush. And then I want them to go away for a while so I don't have to pay them. And then maybe I want them to come back between four and six. And so what you find is these schedules end up creating schedules that are great for the company, but have proved terribly damaging for the people who actually have to try and fit their lives around what the algorithm thinks. And probably, frankly, end up causing long-term damage in the organization as well, because you maximize that match between supply and demand, but you end up driving up attrition as people won't stay with those sorts of schedules. And so I think there's a broader issue. I mean, it's always a tension in managing people. You know, how much do you take into account kind of what those people think? But I think you know, when you have people managed by AI, you have a bunch of assumptions that have been baked in by the schedulers, by the engineers, whoever, that are increasingly detached from what's going on in the ground. And I think that that often leads to some really bad and destructive decisions. And so I think done well, we can incorporate a lot of these algorithms um, and you know, manage people better. But it does require us to really think about how these algorithms are being used and have kind of that closed loop. So we engineer something and then we say, OK, what's actually happening? And we're very alive to the problems it's creating. Go back and re-engineer it. I think when you kind of just sit down, do an optimization problem, then kind of put it out into the world and let everybody suffer the problems. Um, that creates a lot of damage too. So those are some of the things I'm worrying about. I think one of the things that we always talk about is that, you know, first of all, what is the objective function you're optimizing? That's the first thing. And I think we would all agree, and I'll turn it over to Sonny in just a second, would be, you know, these things should be a decision support tool. The minute you automate them, you have those dangers of, you know, it up, you know, if you'd like maximizing some objective that may not be good for the employees and certainly may not be good for the firm. So, Sonny, let me turn things over to you. Since I know for a number of years you've been one of our pioneers in teaching AI to our students, um, what's changed? Like, why are things so, why is everyone so excited today? You know, I'm a statistician. I've been here at Wharton for 28 years. We've been doing, you know, kind of, big data science for a long time. What's unique and what's changed about today that's made, I'm sure, everybody want to take your class, everybody be interested in every single thing you're working on? So I, I think you, I, I think, you know, you, you touched on it just a second ago, uh, but this, this, this tension between a decision support, which is what a lot of technology has been doing for a, a few generations now, moving to this world, uh, potentially, um, either recommending a decision or even automating decisions. And that that's, you know, what we do at work all day, what we do is make decisions, right? And that's what businesses do, that's what organizations are, are optimized to do. And so a technology that can uh, serve as, as that, that can make decisions or recommend decisions has implications uh, for all parts of the organization. People compare it to, you know, electricity. It has a potential to change everything. So I think that's one part of the uh, the reason that people are energized about uh, this particular topic. Uh, the other thing that's that's exciting but also somewhat concerning is that I think there's more unpredictability right now around AI than there has been for tools past, right? So we think about as we scale up these models, people are seeing more emerging capabil capabilities that they would not have expected. So let me press you on this, just this one topic for a second. So I can imagine uncertainty in a few things. One is... Um, I type something into a large language model, chat GPT, Bing AI, et cetera, something comes out. I type the same thing in, maybe something doesn't, the same thing doesn't come out. So that we could call that in the measurement literature, test, retest, reliability. That's one possibility. One is Sunny Tambay changes one word in the prompt, prompt engineering if you'd like, something radically different comes out. What form of uncertainty are you talking about? Well, or maybe yes, it's the no. measurement one that I think about, or maybe it's a different one. Right, no, for when I, when I think about uncertainty in this context, I'm thinking about the uh, the question of where these uh, technologies can add value to the jobs we do, right? And so if I, as a person who uh, designs jobs or an organizational planner, thinks about where it fits in, 
uh, the answer is changing in ways that I think are a little bit unpredictable. And so uh, if we think about what it can do now, what it can do uh, tomorrow, uh, even the people who are at the frontier of this technology find themselves quite surprised these days that we didn't think it was going to be able to do that. And so that kind of uncertainty, um, combined with the fact that it has the potential to affect decisions everywhere, uh, have, have, have a lot of potential for, you know, sort of thinking for, for, for change uh, in ways that we don't exactly know what's coming, but it's, it's energizing in a way. So, Sonny, maybe you could just clarify something for me and for all of our listeners here on our show. Um, the things that generative AI models can do, they don't, I mean, the algorithm itself, the statistical engine itself doesn't just come up with it, right? I mean, somebody has to have programmed it to be able to do a certain type of problem. It's not like it generates solutions to problems it just generates. Let's say you wanted to you wanted your AI engine to make some decision about how to optimally schedule something, which Matthew said. Somebody, a programmer somewhere, had to have said, this is a problem this AI engine should solve. It's not like the AI engine searched around the world and said, let's solve time card scheduling problems. The algorithm doesn't decide the problems. Humans help the algorithm decide which problems to solve, right? Hum humans on the input side absolutely do, t tell it, do, do help it understand what problems to solve. At the same time, they're incredibly general purpose. So what they're capable and flexible enough to solve is is quite quite impressive. Yeah. I know, Matthew, you, you wanted to jump in here and talk about kind of this this idea of kind of the breadth of problems and what the future might be. I mean, well, I think kind of on the uncertainty piece, I yeah. think it's, it's very interesting. I mean, Sonny knows much more about this than I do just for anybody listening at home. So I'm kind of mainly curious to hear what he thinks. But I mean, it strikes me a lot of the uncertainty is is how good they're going to get, how quickly. I mean, I think, you know, you said hey, we're all talking about it and everyone wants to talk about it. Well, it's partly because we're all so surprised by kind of just the leap in capabilities over the last year um, of these models, kind of just blowing through the Turing test in a way that we thought was a long time off. But the big question is, have we now reached another kind of plateau where, you know, at which point you kind of say, these are neat tricks and they can do some things quite well, but the lack of accuracy, the hallucinations, all of those sorts of things, are we ready to turn over large processes to them wholesale? I'm not sure. Or they're really going to improve. And the thing it makes me think about is self-driving cars. I mean, I remember like seven or eight years ago when we were thinking about buying our next car, I thought this is the last car I'll ever buy because, you know, by the time I'm ready to buy another car, all cars will be self-driving, you know, and there will be no steering wheels. Why would we have them? And it turned out you could get like 90% of the way, but that last 10% proved really hard. And so the question in my mind is, a great point. could we see something similar or do we think really they are going to keep improving at this rate? Yeah, no, absolutely. I 100% agree. I mean, the challenges with all these tools, right, is are that, and you mentioned this, I think a little bit when you talked about bias, discrimination and managers, so all of these tools are embedded in a context where we have, I don't know, 200, 250 years of infrastructure about what to do when a manager gets it wrong, right? We understand how to deal with human decision error. Anytime you're talking about putting one of these tools in place, which includes self-driving cars, it includes large language models, and it gets it wrong, we don't have that legal and organizational infrastructure. And that has been an absolute, uh, has been a constraint, and I, I suspect it will continue to be. So we may well have hit a plateau it's just that whenever I think about what the future is going to bring with these tools, you know, I think this is, if I think about the history of science a little bit, this is uh, somewhat rare in that you have a situation where you have a tool that can do certain things and the scientists are now trying to figure out how it works, right? That hasn't happened very often in history. And so this uncertainty is what I, I tend, to, tend to caveat some of those comments because of that uncertainty, which is new, I think, when you compare it to other technological innovation. So let me ask you both next about what I'll call application areas that you think are, let's be positive people, are about extremely positive. So for example, one area that Matthew already mentioned was about hiring. Let me, let me ask you the following, if the following would be a good example or a bad example. So I'm even going back to my days. So prior to coming to Wharton, you two may not know this, I was at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton, and we were working on automated scoring algorithms for essays. Long time ago. People that may not have called it AI, but we were ingesting the words and trying to construct scores, but not for the purpose that when Matthew Bidwell takes the SAT, that's the score he's going to get. But 
how do I use humans in a most efficient way? When I have millions of essays to score, how can I use an engine to basically do a first pass algorithm and then humans will come in on the really tough ones? So let's take hiring as an example, but you use any example you want. Why can't I use an AI engine to do a first pass algorithm to look at a thousand resumes that I get for a job, 950 get pruned off by the algorithm, and then the 50 that seem to have the credentials that match what I want, I then use humans and intervention to go in. So do you have any concerns about that two-step process? Now, bias and discrimination can happen by the algorithm, so maybe there's some in that 950. But what do you think about that? And also, if you have a better example than mine, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear no, it. No, that's great. I would totally do that. Um, so, and I actually, I mean, there've been some experiments with this, um, generally they've worked out reasonably well. I always say it's not so much, I'm, it's not so much that I'm a huge AI optimist. I'm just human skeptic. Um, so I mean, I think the challenge is when you look at people, how people actually make hiring decisions, it's so haphazard that hiring actually, I think is one of the places where this tends to work really well. Now, I mean, we can get back to that question about kind of this decision support is it actually making the decision i mean one thing just to be aware of is i think in practice that is a very fine line i think most of the evidence is people tend to do what they're told um and so frankly if the algorithm says you should hire this person most of the time that's what they're going to do and so you can't you know kind of when we say oh well there's a human in the loop so it's okay yeah but are they really i mean once they've been told this is the right way to do it they're going to largely follow the advice but yes i'm actually i i think that is one of the better places i think there are concerns about bias um my guess is in the vast majority of these cases the bias of the ai is still orders of magnitude less than the biases of the human rate so i'm i'm reasonably bullish on that as a case so, so sonny what's your thought on both the example i gave matthew just talked about and maybe what do you think is the most promising area where ai can have a transformative effect on human resources today That's, i want to underscore and pick up on something you said which is let's be you know positive people i, I think the uh, framing of the conversation uh in the in the broader uh, the press uh maybe has been too much uh zero sum with employers and, and employees or or managers and and workers, and, and, and there may certainly be some of that, but there, uh, it seems that there's a lot of opportunity to use these tools in a way that um, enhances employee experience, enhances employee well-being. I was talking to an executive last week um, that's using generative AI to write performance reviews. And first of all, it saves them a ton of time. But the second thing is that they're able to use that excess time to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities to maybe improve. And they also, by the way, uh, provide more frequent performance reviews. So it's almost on a monthly basis instead of, instead of uh, biannual. So lots of opportunities um, where where we can think about um, the employee. You know, a lot of these tools, what they're doing is they're taking parts of the work that we may not enjoy so much. There are, so definitely, there are definitely uh, places where we can think about using AI, um, at least as a first order, uh, first order, a first order uh, application uh, to think about how, how can work be better uh, how can we do uh, a higher touch, better job in uh, making sure our employees stick around, are happy, and are being productive? So we're here on the Wharton Sirius XM AI series uh, on talking about artificial intelligence. This is sponsored by Analytics at Wharton and AI at Wharton. And again, I'm joined today by my colleagues Matthew Bidwell of the Management Department and Sonny Tambe of our Operations Information and Decisions Department. So Matthew, let me just ask you. Um, one of the things I love doing with my MBA students, actually, I've been doing this for years now, is I always start out one of the lectures and I say, you know, AI, or in that case, machine learning is coming for your job. Which kind of industries or which areas of the workforce do you see, you know, in some sense, if you were advising our MBAs or undergrads, like, I don't know, this seems like a pretty risky area to invest in today as a career. Any particular jump out in you and thinking like, wow, I don't know. Like, for example, I'll pick my home department. If I was in the creative marketing business today, coming up with advertisements, I'd be thinking, I don't know. Seems like AI engines could do a pretty good job of, you know, coming up with a massive combination of features of ads that seem to be effective. I'll just pick one from my home department of marketing. Any, anything come to your mind? I'm nervous about this. I mean, I've, I've chatted with Sonny about this before. We've had kind of two decades of people 
making predictions about what work is going to go away based on AI. And in retrospect, they've mainly been hilariously wrong. Um, so I kind of feel like this is this is an area that's very hard to predict. I mean, we've recently seen these things saying, you know, when we look at which jobs are going to be most affected by these kind of new AI technologies, like things like English teachers are at the top of the list. And you're just like, no, no. I mean, if I think about which jobs are likely to be safest from AI, I cannot see ChatGPT maintaining control in a class of 14 year olds. It's just not going to happen. So I think it's very hard. I mean, we are seeing, I mean, you mentioned kind of creative. I think uh, freelance graphic designers have already really taken a big hit. Um, so we're seeing some jobs, um, SA mills. So if you made your money by ghostwriting papers for college students, I've got really bad news for you. Um, Stack Overflow has just been laying off people, kind of providing advice for programs. But we're, see we're seeing kind of these narrow, kind of slightly strange kind of niches getting wiped out. But I'm not, yeah, I'm nervous about making big predictions about what's going to, what's going to be affected. Any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Matthew on this. I, I'm, I'm relatively uh, optimistic in the sense that uh, we certainly, uh, you want to expect to see some verticals uh, affected quite a bit, maybe maybe customer service operations, customer facing operations. You know, but that's been sort of true of, of tractors and Xerox copiers and everything in between. By and large, the evidence seems to be saying, you know, for la large language models, for, in, uh, for, uh, for example, that all of us are going to be using them to some degree will make us a little bit more productive. The productivity gains will be uh, promising, but it'll be gradual. And so uh, we'll able to be, maybe be able to get rid of some parts of our job we don't like, become a little bit more productive, and any job loss will be at a pace that the economy hopefully will be able to absorb it without any problems. Yeah, I mean, I do think if you'd been, if you'd predicted when the internet came in that one of the occupations that would be worst affected was journalists, you know, we'd have asked you to show you're working, right? I mean, there are kind of, it, it's quite unpredictable how these things play out. So another question I'm sure our listeners here on SiriusXM uh, and our podcast would like to know about is, how are you two as educators using it in your own classes? Like, for example, are you going to allow students to submit assignments using generative AI? Are you going to encourage its use? Are you going to take certain parts of the material that you're teaching students and say, actually, you'd be better off just learning it through a generative AI engine? So, Matthew, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to Sonny, who, you know, one could argue your entire course is about this. So I'd like to start with you, Matthew. How are you going to use it in the courses you teach? Um, it's still a work in progress, I have to say. I mean, so I teach a class on people analytics. Part of that, I get people to um, analyze data sets. Um, you know, I've tried throwing my problem sets into chat GPT. It's made some fairly elementary errors, which has made me reassured that it's not going to make me completely redundant. But I think I'll be encouraging my students that that is a way to work on it, but that they need to understand what the answers are, that just expecting ChatGPT to get it right is going to lead them astray. I think it's it's a big problem. I think for us, though, I mean, as a kind of particularly, say, in the management department, you know, a lot of the way kind of in the social sciences, we have tended to evaluate people and get them to learn is go write a paper. And it's going to take us a while to figure out how to redo pedagogy when that is just so easy just to kind of get an AI to do. So it, 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 I, we are one of the industries actually that I think is most affected in, in some ways. And we're not going to lose our jobs, but we're going to really have to, I hope, but we're really <laughs> going to have to change how we do what we do. And Sonny, both in your answer, I'd love to hear, since I know there's a, at least in one of the two courses I'm well aware of that you teach, there's actually a significant coding portion. So if you could talk, you know, I've heard some people say it doesn't matter, therefore, whether you know R or Python, because you can do the conversion back and forth. Therefore, it's just, you got to be able to program in something and we'll let ChatGPT do the rest. But how are you thinking about it? Yeah, no, sir, absolutely. So so I'm, I'm somewhat fortunate in a way because... AI and analytics are so central to the courses I teach that these questions are, I can just move them directly to the center. You know, and I think what you said is absolutely right. It's first order these days for students to understand how you think about uh, a coding workflow that involves large language models, right? So what changes? Where does the time go? How much coding do you need to be able to know to use this effectively? These are all questions we don't quite know the answer to, but I think belong in the center of these types of courses. And then another course I teach on AI uh, ask some of the bigger questions, the uh, questions Matthew raised, bias, ethics, those sorts of things that we're just not quite prepared for yet, but that managers are absolutely going to have to deal with over the next two decades or so. 
uh, those are also central to uh, how we how we how we spend our our class time and the the, uh, the there's just there's 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 so many emerging questions every year and new questions it's been um, I mean it, it, there's just never enough time so maybe just in the last minute or so that we have I'll ask you each for a 15 second answer so I'm an employee what do I need to know about AI that's going to help me do my job better like what's the one thing I should know how to do as an employee Matthew any thoughts um, experiment. I think basically just try things, play with the technology, get online and see where it can take over parts of your job and make you more effective. Sonny? I would say embrace, uh, be prepared to embrace change. We're just entering a period where I think the way we do uh, functions and operations and business processes is going to start to change quite rapidly. And from an employee's perspective, I think just mentally they should have that mindset that I, should, I need to uh, stay on top of how these things are changing. Well, on behalf of Analytics at Wharton and AI at Wharton, um, I'd like to thank my colleagues Matthew Bidwell and Sonny Tambe for our episode here on AI and human resources. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.